This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. This is The Creative Life Podcast with James Taylor, episode number six. The Creative Life Podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. Hey, it's James Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have today our guest, Vita Chambers. And Vita was born in Vancouver and was raised in Barbados. At 16, she was signed to Universal Motown after they spotted her on MySpace. Her first major performance was at the opening act at the 2009 Thanksgiving NFL halftime show featuring her Motown review. It's a huge first time major performance. Yeah, and this this was quickly followed no by pressure. A, uh, no it's pressure, no pressure at all. It. <laughs> and then, if that wasn't enough pressure, she was that was quickly followed by a 27 date tour with Justin Bieber in 2010. She released her first independent s- uh, single, "Fix You," in 2012, and it was nominated for the Best Dance Record for the 2013 Juno Awards. And within one month, entered the top 40 pop charts in Canada. Since then, she's been touring Can- uh, Asia, Toronto's World Pride, and her last single, What If, was chosen as a theme song for Hamilton Pride. So, Vita, first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So, I believe today you're, you're in beautiful Barbados. I am, yes. I, I get around quite a bit. And how much time are you spending uh, there and how much time are you spending in, uh, in North America just now? Um, in, well, I, I'm based out of Canada, uh, but I grew up here. Um, so I come down every chance I get. So, yeah. A fair amount. And so, you, and you're, you're still based in Vancouver as well, I believe. Um, no, I'm actually not based in Vancouver anymore. I moved to Toronto. Ah, okay. And, uh, yeah, so I work out of there. So share with us, I mean, what's going on in your world just now? What, what current projects are really exciting you? Um... Hmm. Well, I'm releasing a new single and video um, end of February, and I, I'm going to be shooting a lot more videos this year. I'm actually getting into my videos a lot. I've always co-directed my videos and written all the treatments, but um, no, this year I'm going to dive in and do a lot of art-based and fashion-based videos, not just music videos. So I'm very I'm looking forward to that very much, So and touring. Gosh, yes, I have a lot of touring coming touring up. So take us all the way back. How did you first uh, get started singing? What was, the, what was the first introduction? And at what point did you kind of go, actually, I, 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 this is what I want to do? Um, hmm, let's see. Uh, well, I think the first thing I can remember, I mean, I always loved music and I always took every opportunity to um, sing and, and perform and, and, and all stuff like that. Yeah. But... I think the one time I remember I was seven years old and I was singing at a school production and um, I went on stage and I belted out this huge note and I think I was off key or something and I I didn't realize I had such a powerful voice and I was so mortified. I ran off stage and I (laughs) vowed to myself I would never sing again. and then after that, I, I, I just, it came naturally. Um, I ended up meeting some, uh, one of my dad's friends who um, sang professionally in, on Broadway. And uh, I begged him to teach me. And so he did. And, and it kind of progressed from there. And the rest is history. And, and did it feel very kind of seamless going in from uh, kind of getting, singing lessons and just singing around to actually becoming a professional musician, professional singer? Um, yeah, I guess so, because I've been doing it for so long already that I was always, I always constantly like to push myself. So I was training with various coaches and, um, and always improving my craft. So when it came to the professional level, I was used to the, the rigors of constantly trying to do something different and improve myself and trying different styles and, you know, do it, working with different people and, and getting accustomed to their way of working. And talk to us as you're kind of you're starting to work on on new video projects just now, uh, new songs, uh, different recordings. Where do a lot of your new ideas generally come from? I mean, and then how do you go about? Let's say if you're talking about the videos, you're working a lot of kind of video things just now. Yeah. How do you go about developing those ideas as well? Oh, um, I don't know. I 
I work a lot and I work <laughs> crazy hours, but at the same time, I always, I love, I always make sure that I'm either, when I go on tour and I'm traveling, I always put time in my schedule to go and see where I am, or um, I love museums and I, I'm a huge movie buff. I'm incredibly active, so I just like exposing myself to the world and seeing what I'm inspired by and that pretty much influences my music and everything to do with my personal life and my personal experiences. So pretty much everything around me is fuel to inspire something. And how much do you uh, kind of write your own material as well compared to working with w working with other songwriters? I actually write all of my own material. Mo um, most of the time my singles are, or my songs are written solely by myself, but I also co-write um, usually with the producers that I'm working with. I haven't worked with any writers recently, um, but yeah, so I pretty much do most of the grunt work. <laughs> so, I mean, that's something, because obviously that's not the way that all singers, especially in the kind of style that you're singing in, will work. Often they'll, they'll, they'll almost be kind of songwriting teams working yeah. for them and then the, you know they, they'll often put a bunch of songwriters together somewhere for a week we'll work on a bunch of stuff and then the artist and, and maybe the manager will come in or the A&R will come in at the end of that weekend and just pick mm -hmm. what's going to work for for the album what's going to work for the for the next single so yeah. so was that quite a conscious decision on your part to actually really kind of have that that early thing of writing your own songs um because a, a lot of people will delegate you know will dig, dig, delegate that to someone else mm -hmm. but no absolutely not yeah <laughs> um, yeah so that, that's that when, that's quite an important kind of thing yeah. that a lot, of, a lot of singers don't do absolutely no when i first got signed and i moved to new york I, I i didn't write any of my own music and i didn't consider myself a writer and i didn't see myself writing any of my own music um so lots of the songs that i sang when i was signed were written for me and um basically it was just sent to me and said what do you think oh i like it okay great and that was it um but when i went independent i i had already been through the whole system the label system and how they develop music for artists and everything and i knew that i wanted to say something different and i wanted my music to sound different to what i'd been doing in the past and i couldn't I wasn't. I didn't have access to the people that I wanted to write with, so um, ultimately it was a matter of well, I have to learn how to write for myself now <laughs> if I want the words that I want. So no one else is writing this for me, so I have to do it. So I pretty much just dove into as many writing sessions as I could get myself into, and for about two years, I probably. <laughs> saw upwards of probably 200 writing sessions it was a bit strenuous but um and I just learned I absorbed I sat and I just listened and started creating my own sound and I uh, started reading a lot of poetry and yeah I just really honed in on my craft and a lot of those writing sessions those were with with co-writers who maybe had more experience yeah. as as as, uh, as songwriters, so what were some exactly. of the, what were some of the things that you picked up early on um, in terms of just w ways that, that you can show you could really tap into that natural creativity that you've got anyway? Well, when it comes to artists, I mean, no, no two are the same. Um, so I definitely learned so many different strange rituals <laughs> um so, so tell us some of those what are the, some of the strange songwriting rituals hmm let's see um some of them were running around outside with an instrument and <laughs> the first melody <laughs> that comes yeah. we use it um i've had some very very strange i've worked with a lot of su uh, superstitious people um i remember there was one uh, team that i worked with and they would stick a piece of paper on the ceiling and if it, we would just throw out ideas and the time that the piece of paper fell to the floor, that's the idea that we would go with. Okay. So strange. I promise you I'm not making this up. <laughs> and were the, were the songs good at the end of it? Or was it just really just a way to, to kind of unlock um, some ideas that you might not use those particular ideas, but they might turn into something? I think they were a great... Um, 
experience. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't end up, I, we didn't end up using some of those, but um, I definitely learned some different writing styles within my many writing sessions. And, and were you traveling around for a lot of these sessions as well? I mean, obviously the, the, in Nashville, they, they have a certain way of writing, a certain way of doing <laughs> things as, a, as opposed to maybe in London or, or in um, Toronto or, or, or kind of L.A., um, no. Were you traveling around in different places to kind of get different experiences of how they how they would write in those places? Yeah, I was writing um, here in Barbados. I was writing in New York. I was writing in L.A. and Toronto. So I was jumping up and down all over the place. And were, were there any differences that you noticed be- between writers in these different places? Did the did the, how much or oh, or oh, did it did did the place seep in uh, into the songs? Um. No, I don't. No, not that I can. Not that I remember. Um, no, everyone was pretty much unique, just in themselves. Um, not necessarily influenced by their environment. I don't think. No. And as a, as a creative person, you, you've kind of gone through this journey of of uh, being on a major label where, where you do things in a certain kind of way to mm-hmm. being independent now as well. What yes. What are some of the um, what are some of the, the, the pluses and minuses what, f- for that experience of being, in, of being an independent artist today? Um, well, the pluses, uh, definitely I have complete creative control. That's also a minus at the same time. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, I, I'm able, I have the freedom to create whatever I want to create and do something ridiculously out of the box and... Um, I run my own company and I'm able to choose who I want to work with and I plan my shows and I, I make my vision uh, and, 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 and try and execute it as best I can. Um, and I think all of those are followed by their negatives because, I mean, when it comes to being signed with a label, you have a team that you put everything through. And sometimes it is comforting to bounce ideas off of uh, a team and have them um, have them say, be expert in, experts in certain fields and say, well, no, this doesn't necessarily work in this field and blah, 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 blah. But um, we're a very small team, so we, we kind of just have to go with our gut and um, make a decision on the spot and, and stick with it and be committed to it, and, uh, however it turns out. So I think those are the, some of the negatives and positives of being independent. And what would you say as a, as a creative yourself, as a songwriter, as a music artist, what would you say are your, your biggest strengths and weaknesses? Hmm. My strengths, I think, thus far would definitely have to be my dedication and my fearlessness when it comes to trying something new. I'm not afraid to release one style of music and it do very well and then my next single release a completely different genre and even though the previous did well in that genre changing over to something completely different I think taking that kind of a risk is good uh, my negatives hmm let's see I think it would just have to be not to sound caught co- well no Actually, I think it's not necessarily a negative, but um, I think I'm still very new into the world of being independent. And it's a whole new thing that is being introduced into the music world and industry where artists are going independent. So it's these uncharted territory that we're trying to navigate our way through. So there isn't a lot to look back on and say, well, this is how they did it and that's how we must do it. So I think our negative is really not having a template or format in which to follow. So we're kind of walking blind a little bit, but um, yeah. we're learning as we go. And we do make mistakes, but we learn from them. And as long as we don't make them again, that's really the most important thing. Yeah, I mean, it's such an interesting time. Uh, well, I think it's the Chinese that say, "May you not live in interesting times." But we're definitely living in interesting <laughs> times in, in the in the music industry just now. And uh, yes. I was reading, I think it's in Wired magazine of this month for, with uh, uh, Lady Gaga's manager, and just talking about um, 
how how managers the role of managers have changed over the years where yeah. uh, you know in the obviously in the 50s they were they were only one step removed from uh kind of uh gangsters really mm-hmm. um and uh they, they hadn't changed much they hadn't changed that much. Well, <laughs> maybe in some some styles and then it, it changes over time then you have certain artists certain managers who are still gangsters but the gangsters are very much looking out for their their talent their artists as well so the power yeah. dynamic changes slightly and then and then more recently, you've got really kind of uh, with it, when the record industry started to kind of implode, the role of the manager became even more central and more important um, because they were at the center of everything, of all the relationships. And they were the CEO of the artists, you know, businesses. Um, and they, they, you know, and they did think more like folks in business rather than maybe in, in the in the past where it was a little bit more kind of wheeling wheeling and dealing and they do think much more um uh, much more kind of laterally thinking about apps and and not just thinking about the you know the audio experience they're thinking much more in terms of the the overall experience of the fan and thinking about you know what other things might the fan how else can can we take this artist brand and and break into new yeah. areas and do interesting things with this artist brand as well and have partnerships Absolutely. with interesting things as well so so you you are at a really interesting time in history because you were i suppose you were going through a period where you 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 had that experience of the old system with the, you know the, the universals and the, and the Motown side of things, but you're now fully into the into kind of what's happening now around independent artists. So, it, yeah. so it must be. It, I can understand it must be both a um, a challenging time, but also quite an exciting time as well. It is. I mean, like I said, it's completely unknown. You know, this whole area, um, and there isn't a right way, and there isn't necessarily a wrong way of going about it but I think the most important thing for an artist to cultivate while you know wanting to be independent is that they must have a great team behind them and I'm not I don't mean you must have like a staff of 100 or 50 people running around doing your work for you I mean a team it can be down to two people down to a million people you know everyone has to be independently sturdy and strong and well versed in their craft um i i co-manage my project with my parents i worked with about 10 managers and after the 10th one i said this is it you name it it happened to me everything the good and the bad and the ugly and they were the only ones i trusted um and they ran their own businesses in the past and i said well you guys have a business mind i need to look at this as a business because it's wonderful. The art, the artistic side is so important um, because that is your brand and that is who you are and that's the thing that's going to separate you from everybody else. However, the business side is equally as important because you have to have organization. You have to have a plan because if you just create all this beautiful work and you don't have any avenues in which to distribute it or promote it or have it seen by the right people – it's just going to be sitting there and you're not going to go anywhere or grow from it. So I think it's very important to have people who um, are very good in their areas. Um, I, I work with a lot of amazing people. Actually, lots of them actually were my friends because I've been in this for so long. Well, not incredibly long, but long enough that I formed a lot of great relationships and as we all started to grow, they started creating their own companies. And I said, well, listen, let's partner up and do a project. Um, but as long as you have people who are devoted to your project, who are ready to, you know, you need someone when they introduce you or, or share you with somebody else and, and they don't know of you, that person needs to convince them that you are the greatest thing that they've ever heard. And basically like a sales pitch. So you need that person to believe in you so strongly that they'll do everything in their power to make sure that this person walks away with a very good impression or the greatest impression that they can get out of that person's uh, introduction to you. So I think that's very important, having a very strong and sturdy team. And, and that, that's hard as an artist to kind of big yourself up in the first person. <laughs> Where, it is hard too. Yeah. And, it's, and it's kind of, I don't know, I, I grew up in the Caribbean and you know we're very laid back 
originally, you know, culturally. So I'm not used to going and being in people's faces and say, hi, look at me. And, you know, this is my music and you must like it. I'll never forget when we'd be in front of people, my dad, he would go and hand out business cards. And to be honest, I would be very embarrassed. I'd be like, dad, no. <laughs> and he's like, I'm your manager. I have to do this. And I'd be standing there. I'm like, hi. But, you know, that's what you have to do. And yeah. I mean, go about it, you know, the most you know, innocent and, and, um, and, and what's the word I'm looking for? I think being very humble about it, but, um, you have to be, it's, it's a product. Yeah. Oops, sorry. <laughs> and, and I mean, there's a, there's a great history of, of artists being managed by other family members as well. So, yeah. I mean, there's, there's and, I, and I completely, having done that myself, having, uh, having managed an artist who was a, was a family member and very successful. And then also managing artists who have been platinum sellers who have not been family members. There's definitely a different dynamic that goes on when it's, yeah. when it's blood, uh, because there's a lot it, of things it, that don't have to be said. There's a lot of trust absolutely. things that don't, you don't have to kind of go anywhere. Um, what I suppose one of the challenging things around that though, is when it comes to, like family time, family dinners and occasions and stuff, the ability to be able to maybe switch off the 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 work thing, and actually yeah. just enjoy enjoy the company of your family as as family members. So how how have you managed to kind of deal with that as a as a family member and and not be you know so every single conversation is about you know right. this next record or this next video or whatever the thing you're you're currently working on. It is very hard because you know. Um, we're so consumed and it is a 24 seven kind of business. It isn't just a nine to five and then you go home and that's it. It's something that we're constantly having to feed into, um, to make work. So, you know, I'll be asleep, but you know, and then my mom comes in my room at 3am. Vita, we just got an email for a show in, you know, Timbuktu and we have to respond now or, you know, things like that. So there's all hours of the day are pretty much catered to to running the business but at the same time you know we're all passionate about the project and everyone has their own views and sometimes it gets really heated because we don't necessarily agree on how to approach a situation or whether we should take on a project or not so we kind of had to we've had many long discussions about you know, how we work together and understanding one another and how we communicate with one another and basically saying, this is, this is the time where I need off. I, I, I can't, I can't talk about this for a few minutes because it is a lot. It's very stressful. And, you know, we're, we're being an independent artist. It isn't exactly the easiest because you don't have this huge machine um, behind you and backing you and, and, and running and, kind of holding your flag while you're relaxing a little bit you you are the one doing all of that so um you need to be able to take time away for yourself in short intervals and still be attentive and i don't know we we all kind of share the the responsibility of running the company so i think once you all are under our understanding of each other's emotions and uh, you know how each of you work and when each other's breaking point is that's when you know we're like okay I'll take on your load for a little bit you go and have some time to yourself so I think that's very important and but it's taken you know two years and we're still we're still growing we still have our our tete -tete -tete it's, and it's, our a, it's a challenge it's definitely <laughs> it and and I speak to a lot of uh, music artists who, who, who may be managed by their partner as well. Yeah. And that yes. adds a different dynamic to it <laughs> as well. So yeah, it definitely has. Yeah. So tell us about a time when you, you worked on a creative project and you've given it your heart and your soul, you've given it everything, but it just didn't work out like you'd, you'd hoped. And more importantly, what, are the, the, what were the lessons that you learned from that experience? Let's see. Um, I mean, I've definitely had a lot of writing sessions where, you know, you walk in and, well, actually there was one um, that I can think of. I it was worked with some pretty big producers and we went in and I was working with two other writers at the time. I was still signed this time. And we created this incredible song. It was so great and it was ahead of its time and we were so excited about it. 
Um, we wrote it, and then the production company that I was working with, they liked it, but they didn't like the verse, so they decided that they re would rewrite the verse, but I didn't like the verse, but they loved it. And, uh, and then on top of it, the two writers that I had originally written it with, they were a team at the time, and then during the time of us rewriting the verses, they decided to break up and were fighting over the splits. And, and then my production company who rewrote it, they were arguing over the writing and I didn't like it, so I didn't want to sing it. So then they decided to bring in two other people to write it. And those two other people didn't like what we wrote. and We didn't really like what they, so it was a complete mess. By the end of it, there were like 10 people who had written on just two verses and it was such a mess to um, sort out the publishing and the writing splits because everyone was so greedy. Everyone wanted, you know, majority share of the song when they only wrote two lines. And, you know, so it was very frustrating. And I ultimately was saying, well, I'll only take, you know, 10% and everybody else, you divvy up the 90%. Um, so it was, it was very difficult. And then ultimately that song never got released. So, and that was about a year of negotiating and my lawyer calling me and I calling them and hearing what they wrote. It was, it was a lot. So from that point on, I kind of decided that no more than three writers can be involved in one song. Yeah. Um, that I was going to take most of the responsibility when it came to writing the song. But if I did have trouble and, you know, only three people, that's, that's my max. Um, and also signing off on lyrics right then and there. Um, I feel that that's something that's very important. When you're writing with writers, it's kind of, it, it, it's, it's uncomfortable when you first go into a session and then you're talking about splits and you're talking about money and shares. You know, it kind of ruins the whole creative vibe. But it's something that's so important because if you create something so great and everyone's excited about it and then you leave all the paperwork and the business to do at the end, that then creates tension if you don't necessarily agree on um, how the song should be split. And then it gets just – everyone feels a little uncomfortable. So I always try to – discuss the business end of it first, get that all out of the way. And then once we're both on the same page, we can write something amazing and all the stress and the pressure is all off. So that's definitely something that I've learned that one session really. <laughs> get, get, get the business out of the way, get the exactly. work out who's, who's getting what and, uh, yeah. and then just get on with creating. So, and then everyone's all smiles and it's unicorns and ponies. Great. Yeah. Lovely. As, as, tell us about any um, aha moments or insights in your life and in this journey you've had times where you've gone, oh, okay, I, I need to go this particular direction or I, or this is, this is a new realization you had about what you needed to be doing. I think, I think the biggest aha moment thus far in my career has definitely been the decision to go independent and realize that that was the best thing for me. Um, because you know, you not necessarily brainwashed, but it's when you think of, going and becoming an artist, it's the first thing you think of is like, okay, well, I have to get signed. And that's just, that's just the way it's always been. And, um, so thinking of tackling or, or basically considering tackling this whole entire industry without that, you know, sturdy, stable company and that institution supporting you is kind of daunting. Um, and when I, when I decided to go independent, I won't lie, I was petrified and I wasn't sure I was making the right decision. And I just, I just loved music so much. And the thought of not doing music was just heartbreaking. So I kind of was like, well, this is my only, my only choice. I have to go independent. But I was scared out of my mind because I didn't think I could do it without a label. You know, I'd only been in this industry for four years and here I am going and starting up my own label and releasing my own music and writing my own music. Was I good enough? You know, was I good enough to compete with the independent art? I mean, with the international artists because I didn't want to do it just as a, you know, singing in coffee shops, that wasn't, that wasn't my dream. I wanted to be, I want to be a huge artist. So was this something that could be done? And so I had all those questions constantly running through my mind. And I'd also been through a lot with signing with two labels and 
working with 10 managers, you know, and like I said, you name it, it happened. I had my money stolen from me. I had my signatures forged. I had people who just didn't do anything. I had people who paired me up with lots of the wrong people. Um, I, I had as much, as many amazing experiences as I had. I equally had some really horrible ones too. And so that definitely bruised me and, you know, chipped away a piece of my soul. So I really didn't have a lot of confidence in myself. And that's when my parents came in and um, started managing me because I really didn't trust anyone at that point. And I said, you two are the only people I know who have my best interest at heart. And they were the ones who really kind of held held me up and were my backbone for a good good year and a half until I finally gained the confidence to kind of speak for myself and, and, and really stand behind my work and say, no, I am good enough and I can do this on my own. And were there, um, were, were there any mentors that you had in that time of other artists that had gone on that same path, that had been on a major label, that had gone independent and had success doing that or, and were happier doing that? Um, I think along the way I heard of a few stories like Macklemore was a really big one. I was like, oh, my God, okay, yes, we can do this. Um, he just went and accepted a Grammy and I'll never forget in his acceptance speech, he said to all the artists who are doing it independently, you can do it independently. You can do it without a label. And that was really a big moment for me because I was like, he was really one of the first ones who really made it big mm. um, and, you know, was out there and doing it, doing what I wanted to do. And uh, he did it on his own. So that was a, a nice push. Was, and ever since, sorry. No, please, please, Karen. I, I, you just you reminded me of a story, just as you're talking about this, of yeah. of that that of you know it is very scary if you've been oh, in that yeah. major label system coming out of that and being an independent. And I remember hearing a story um, a couple of years back of an artist who was 16. Um, mm -hmm. I was part of a group and they got uh, first record did really well second record didn't, didn't do so well and, and this kid was 16 taken into in the the CEO's office of the label and saying uh, I'm sorry but we're, we're we're dropping you as an artist and your career as a musician is over yeah, <laughs> and, and, that's the and, biggest fear it and, is and he yeah. said he said I was 16 <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> Your career is over at sixteen, isn't? It's and so it's obviously a joke, you know, because he because he just went on to do. do you, you go on to do other things. He said, "I'm I'm a music artist. This is what I do." Yeah, no, exactly. And you know, I think think lots of artists they have the mentality that I need an you know I need label. I need a label, and artists need labels, and this is the only way to succeed. But I think people also forget that labels need artists in order to stay in business. Um, so I think putting so much power into one thing is very dangerous, um, especially when it comes to the mindset of an artist because it can crush a lot of dreams. And, like, and just like that story, I mean, the fact that the label called him in and said, we're dropping you and your career is over at, the, you know, at 16, come on, that's when you're just getting started. Yeah. So I think and I, it's hard. Sometimes that can crush people's dreams and that will end it. That will be it for them. And saying, well, they told me that I can't do it, so then therefore I can't do it. Um, that's a really tough thing. I'll never forget when I was 19, when I decided that I want to go to be independent. I flew up to New York by myself, and I went into the head of my label, Universal Republic, and I went in at 19 and said, you know, I don't think that this is the right fit. I don't think that this is going to work. You know, me being signed under you, I, I'm, it's not working. So I had to go and do that on my own, which is really tough. And it's... Um. And it's really hard, too, because either I'm making the best decision of my life or I'm making the worst one. But I don't know yet. I'll find out in a couple of years. You're just and, and what advice would you give, have, having been through this uh, mm -hmm. journey, what advice would you give? Let's imagine that, you know, that 15-year-old girl, great voice, great, you know, potential talent. And she's in, whether it's Vancouver or Barbados or, or London or New York or wherever she is in the world. What what advice would you, you give to them about... Um, becoming successful as a as a as a music artist and and actually doing something with this creativity they have um one thing that I, an incredible vocal coach i had her name was marissa or her name is marissa Lindsay, and she trained me for about uh since oh my goodness wow for about six years before i moved to um new york she told me one time she said 
at some point in your life and your career, you're going to want something so badly and the world's the world is going to be against you and you'll start questioning your own dedication and and motivation in order to achieve this and she said the only person that you should turn to for support is yourself and i remember that and it always stuck with me i never understood it i thought it was crazy until i actually went through the whole process of becoming independent you know all the people that I had worked with up until that point were basically saying, well, if you're not signed to a label, you're not going to go anywhere. This is, this is it. This is the end. And my parents were very supportive, of course, but you know, we, they didn't really know the music industry at that time. So they couldn't say, this is the right thing to do or this is the wrong thing to do. They said, well, if this feels right to you, then we'll support you. So at the end of the day, I had to... I had to be the driving force and the one to say, this, this is what's right for me. And yes, I'm making the right decision. And I had to kind of fall back on myself and question whether or not this was right. So I think that's the biggest piece of advice. When, when you want something so badly and the thought of it, the thought of not doing it is even worse than the thought of you failing and doing it. Um, I think that that's when you know that you have to be the person to you have to be your biggest advocate yeah yeah and can you share a personal habit or some kind of daily ritual that you think contributes to your success as a as a creative artist hmm. well um i'm a bit of a night owl and i past like midnight i feel i don't know it's kind of weird but i feel people are most creative at like the early hours of the morning. So at that time, I just sit down and I start looking at music videos from like the earliest music videos all up until the recent ones. I, oh, I invest myself just, I'm obsessed with looking at live performances, the greats, the new ones, and picking apart pieces that I love. And then I also read lyrics and I, and I write and I just write things. I write poems and Every time an idea comes to me, even during the day, I always keep either on my phone or a little notepad and paper and I write it down, even if it's just a word or a line or something, because it could, I've had many times where it sat on my phone for actually my new single, funny enough, um, I had one line that I came up with and I think I came up with it with like, I don't know, two years ago. And it just stayed on my phone. And I went looking through my phone because I was a little bit stuck writing. And that line just sparked something. And I ended up writing the whole entire song in 20 minutes just from that one line that I writ that I'd written two years ago. So I think constantly looking at things in order to improve your craft and 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 always trying to pull from different areas and and just feeding into anything that could inspire you is the most important thing. And you were mentioning, you know, having been able to kind of quickly capture ideas at any moment as well. Do you have any online resources or, or tools like Evernote that you, that you absolutely love to use and you find really yeah. useful? Actually, my biggest, my biggest site that I go into a lot when I write is rhyme.com. Yeah. Because sometimes you're trying to find something that goes with the word and, that site has saved me many times. I love that site. <laughs> Actually, we've had quite a few guests that have mentioned uh, all different kind of rhyming websites. There's some, there's some great yeah. ones out there as well, different apps and things. Absolutely. And if you could recommend just one record and one book to our listeners, what would they be? Oh, my gosh. One record. Hmm. That's a hard one. Um, well, one book. I think it would have to be the recent, one of the most recent books that I've read. It was called Beautiful Ruins. And it was just such a great story, such a great story told. Um, and it left me thinking. I think those are the best books when they leave you thinking about it for like the next two weeks. You yeah. just find yourself daydreaming thinking about it. Uh, so that was a great one. And the best album to ever be caught with. Oh, I would have to say, hmm. You know, I don't remember the name of the album, but... Um, one album that really sparked my, I, I was so inspired by it and, and it just 
drew me in. Do you know of an artist called Imogen Heap? Yeah, absolutely. I'm trying to remember her album. I but it was the one with the song Let It Go on it. And um that that album, I still have it on my phone and I listen to it every time I go on the airplane. It's just such an a beautiful, incredible album. I think the writing's amazing on it. I think the music on it is amazing and she is just such an incredible artist. She does everything on her own. So yeah. I love her. In fact, I think I was talking to someone the other day from Pledge Music. I think she ran one of her latest crowdfunding campaigns um, through yeah. Pledge as well. And I think it had a lot of success. So if, if our listeners, if they go to jamestaylor.me and mm-hmm. they just put in uh, Vita in the search bar, they'll be able to get all the show notes. And I'll put the link to that. I'll find the, the name of that oh, album uh, and I'll, I'll put the link to that as well. So people can so go much. and listen to it and, and kind of get inspired as well. So Absolutely. final question for you. Let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning. And okay. you had to start from scratch. So oh. you have the skills that you've developed as and the craft you developed as a songwriter and as, as, a, as a, a performing artist. But yes. you know no one. You have no contacts. No one knows you. How would you restart things? Would I know that I've been taken back to the start? <laughs> <laughs> Let, listen, if I did, I would cry quite a bit. <laughs> so after you've stopped crying, yeah. what would you do next? Um, hmm. I think, mm, goodness, I think what I'm doing right now, um, I, it's very, it's a hard question because all the things that I've done so far have been based off of the experiences that I've gained along the way. So I had to go through those in order to learn what I'm able to do now. But um, being in this day and age in, you know, 2016, I think the right way to do it is to make sure that you have as much creative control over your work as possible because I think people are becoming very, very, well, they want, they want good, they want great art. They want quality music. They want, you know, lyrics that actually mean something and, and, and are witty and sound like they have, some creativity behind them, not just fluff anymore. Um, And because they're becoming very picky with their music. So I think starting my own production company and and doing it on my own and working with as many people as I can. And the beauty of today is that a producer doesn't have to be this person in a very expensive studio setting with, you know, that you have to pay hundreds of dollars for per hour you know a studio can be just a 16 year old kid in his basement with his computer who has great talent so I think just immersing yourself into that world of young artists and meeting as many people as you can and working with as many people as you can and just gaining as much experience and making music and making sure that what you make is true to who you are and 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 just love it and the more you love it the more you'll strive to make it better and 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 completely make it you and make it great and focus on all the detail of it so i think that's what i would do i'd just do what i'm doing now <laughs> yeah, that's great that's a, that's a good thing to say so um share with our guests the best ways that they can uh, connect with you learn uh, your what new things you're putting out the new videos where, where should they go um well definitely follow me on twitter at Vita Chambers, um, my website. I constantly upload different um, artistic things that I'm doing. I do a lot of photo shoots with different artists and designers. So www.vitachambers.com. And on Instagram, um, I am a huge Instagrammer and I document my crazy, ridiculous life on there. Great. So please follow at Vita Chambers again. And I also talk to my fans. I find that really big. I love to hear what they have to say and keep a very close connection with my fans. They're the reason I am where I am. Awesome. And we'll put all those in the show notes. People go to jamestaylor.me. They'll be able to get all those links as well. So Vita, thank you so much. I wish you all the best with the new singles, um, the new videos, everything that you're, you're currently working on and life as an independent artist as well i wish you all the best thank you so much thank you thank you thank you james hey james taylor here again and if you're interested in living a more creative life then i'd love to invite you to join me as i share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use i put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to james taylor.me that's james taylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity